Okay, it's 1.30. Okay, for everyone attending, um, it was a great opportunity. Um, so uh, to give a thumbnail background, for those of you who don't know Keith, he got his MD and PhD at Duke, um, subsequently came to the University of Washington for an APCP residency. Uh, well, I was actually program director, brings back a lot of memories, Keith. Mm -hmm. um, subsequently, a fellowship in virology in 98, and then continued in laboratory uh, medicine, where uh, and the department, of course, becoming the Department of Laboratory Medicine and Pathology on July 1st, where he's professor of laboratory medicine and full member at the Fred Hodge Cancer Center. He's head of the virology di uh, division in lab medicine. So a couple of things he is, based on his CV, very involved in international um, attempts to uh, cure all of the, the range of heretofore incurable or hard to deal with viral infections, historically HIV, hep hepatitis B, papillomavirus, herpes. And then since um, the beginning of this year, uh, focusing his attention on CARS, SARS-CoV-2, and I noticed about 14 publications um, and rising, I presume, since then. And one of his uh, mentees, Alice Graniter, has, has, I think as many of you uh, are aware, has been very um, involved and, and the public face to a degree, at least from my reading of the news, in um, talking about the assays that the University of Washington has developed for both the infection and now for the antibodies. And so um, based on all of the work that Keith and his colleagues are doing, I think UW is really one of the leaders in the country in developing assays. So um, Keith is gonna be talking about six months of the US COVID-19 outbreak and talking about the assays, um, sequencing techniques, limitations of techniques, and everything we want to know. So Keith, take her away. All right. Thanks, Larry. Right. Uh -oh. I'm having just a, a moment here of sharing. Sharing issues. screen. Yep. Um, Okay, you're gonna to have to give me a minute here. Hang on, I, 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 I will be right back. Okay. So as everyone's thinking about questions, uh, feel free to add them to the chat. And one of the questions I'll pose is I noticed that uh, at least based on the state of Washington um, public health announcements uh, represented in the Daily Seattle Times, much of a decrease in the rate of infection and even the death rate, although the latter is pretty wobbly, so it's hard to get a sense. So I'll, I'll be interested in, in Keith, your comments on that. <laughs> Let's see if I can share now. Hey, well, getting close. Yep, I just needed to uh, restart there briefly. Can you see my screen? Yeah, I can. Wonderful. Yeah. Okay. That's great. Um, thanks, thanks, Larry, for the nice introduction for the, and also for the uh, invitation to speak. Um, you know, loosely speaking, um, you know, it's wonderful to be doing pathology grand rounds right sort of on the cusp of this change in this merger of our departments into uh, what's going to be really, I think, the premier department of laboratory medicine and pathology in the country. Um, so we're, I think we're uh, really excited about what that's going to mean. Um, and the other reason I say, you know, loosely talking about being around that time is I've had a couple of people point out uh, talking about six months of the U.S. COVID outbreak. And as you might know, we're about six months into the entire COVID outbreak. We think about when uh, things actually started in China. Um, and, and we were about a month later for getting things in the U.S. And so, um, uh, but I thought five months of the U.S. outbreak just sound as nice as six. So 
I'm going to ask folks to make sure you're on mute. I'm getting a fair bit of feedback here, and, and I'll bet everybody else is as well. So if you'd be sure you're muted, that would be great. Thanks. All right. So uh, no card carrying virologist can start a talk without giving you some molecular virology of whatever we're dealing with here. And, and of course, the cause of COVID, uh, the, the clinical syndrome of COVID is SARS coronavirus 2. This is a member of the coronavirus family. There are um, four endemic coronaviruses that you can see listed first, uh, 229E, NL63, OC43, and HK, HKU1. Um, those basically cause the common cold. They're a fairly uh, frequent cause of, of what we perceive as the common cold, along with rhinoviruses and some other things. Um, pretty benign illnesses. Um, then there's more severe things like MERS, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, coronavirus, and then of course the original SARS coronavirus uh, that we don't think about so much anymore. It actually caused quite a stir um, almost 20 years ago. These are positive sent single-stranded RNA viruses. That just means that this, the strand that's in the virus is the one that actually can be transcribed or, or, or translated into RNA, excuse me. Um, this is a big virus. It has 30,000 base pair genome. Um, as RNA viruses go, that's actually quite big. We think about RNA viruses as being smaller. For perspective, a virus like HIV has about 10,000 base pairs. Um, uh, another common one is hepatitis B has about 3,000 base pairs. So this is much bigger. And because it's so much bigger, the virus actually has to be careful when it replicates and it, it has to actually uh, do this replication in a careful way. So it actually is unique among uh, RNA viruses. It has a proofreading enzyme this three prime to five prime exorabinuclease. And what that means is that the virus actually mutates fairly slowly. And this will come up a couple of times, the implications of this in the talk. Um, one is when we look at the sequence data, um, individual patients don't have the quasi species like we think about with HIV or hepatitis C, where uh, there's a swarm of genetically related viruses with an individual. Um, it's much more clonal with an individual here, but the virus just mutates more slowly, which means, um, it actually mutates at a really nice rate for tracking uh, viral transmission, and I'll show you some data on that. It also means that when we get uh, drugs and when we get vaccines, um, the virus is going to mutate fairly slowly away from those. So hopefully, these drugs uh, will be will, will will be useful for an extended period. The virus has a couple of structural proteins. We'll talk a little bit about those in terms of what the antibody assays recognize. Uh, the big ones you'll hear about there are the nucleocapsid. Um, and that's um, over here in these little swirls that actually surround the viral genome. And then the spike that's on the surface this is why we call it a coronavirus. And antibodies to this spike are the ones we think about that actually neutralize the virus. That is, they bind to it and then they prevent it from infecting new cells. And as I mentioned, this virus causes COVID-19, which we really found out about six months ago, starting in Wuhan, China. All right. Um, so we've done a lot around this and working with a lot of people. And this is actually from a, an opinion piece that I was asked to participate in a while ago, just to illustrate that we have, we have dealt with an issue from the very beginning is, you know, there, there's all these people who are at risk of COVID and most of them aren't getting tested. Um, maybe some are getting tests and then are they actually good tests and are they active? Are they getting results back fast enough to do anything about it? And are the results of high enough quality that you can put quantitation on? And these have really been the challenges that we've been dealing with for the last five or six months now, is how do you get a, a, a capacity to do testing that provides accurate rapid testing for just an unprecedented onslaught of people who need this? And that's really what the talk's largely about is how do we, how did we make those tests? How do they work? Um, how have we applied them and, and what have we learned from all this? And, and so what you're going to see in the talk today is really just a, 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 just a quick storm through a lot of collaborative work, um, very Seattle centric. So with the collaborators we've worked at here, but to give you a sense about what our group has done working with others um, and really how I think it's really impacted the pandemic in a very positive way. So this from this morning, it's the New York Times, they publish this map every day. Um, and basically the size of the circle is the size of how many cases are in, I think it's county by county. Um, but you can see, of course, you know, there's all these in, in, in the Northeast and now we're seeing that the Southeast US is actually the current hotspot. 
it's worth remembering that the first place the virus actually hit in the United States is right up here where we are, uh, either Seattle or just north of us. Um, and it is actually a real success story in a lot of ways that, you know, despite all the false starts and all the things that all of us might have done better, at least in our region, we've actually done a reasonably good job at getting us off of, you know, the dramatic parts of this map. If you look here, you wouldn't think that's where this all started looking at it today. So that's a really wonderful bit of good news. Um, so I want to get you into what we did here in Seattle and UW Virology um, as the virus started up. And um, one point that I'll make early on, um, you know, I'm going to show you all the tests we developed and, and how we were able to develop them. But the fact is, we, we benefited from the fact that it started in China. And so we were able to learn a little bit from their experience, including the sequences that they made available. But in fact, we wouldn't, that wouldn't have had to have been the case. So we actually had the capacity in our laboratory that if this had arisen here, we would have found it. Um, and, and the reason that we know that is that um, once we started getting cases that we could diagnose, we actually put them back into something that we had existing a metagenomic pipeline and, and what metagenomics just means in a basic sense is that you can go into a sample and sequence it and without any a priori knowledge you can find what viruses are there by comparing it to the known database of viruses. Um, uh, so what we did was put some of these early samples through um, this metagenomic pipeline um, and then compared it to the database that we would look at before there was SARS-CoV-2. So what did it look like in the database that we had last autumn? And so Vikas Padu in the lab uh, led this work for us. And what he showed is that all of those samples would have come out and actually been read as a SARS-related uh, coronavirus. Okay, so we'd have found a virus, we found a virus that was about 98% uh, identical to this SARS coronavirus from 2003. Um, and also related to some bat coronaviruses and pangolin coronaviruses. But we would have known this is common to all the patients and, and that's what they have. And you can see this here, here's the number of reads that they all have. Of course, when you do that, excuse me, you also find other things that people have because it's an un, unfocused uh, thing. So we found patients who were co-infected with parainfluenza virus. We found some of our folks who didn't have a uh, SARS coronavirus, but thought they might. In fact, they both had human rhinovirus. And then you can find uh, commensals in the nose like Morixella and the skin, uh, skin commensals like uh, 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 could have been there, acne. So there's, there's a variety of things. So we actually would have been a great place for this to happen and we had the capacity, but of course that isn't what happened um, because we knew what the virus was. So that all came out because of this pipeline, but we also just sequenced virus. And so one of the things early on that we wanted to do was to sequence the positives that we had to understand where they came from. And so, um, we had a, a pretty robust viral sequencing program before this started. We were actually surprisingly the world's biggest depositor of coronavirus sequences before there was SARS-CoV-2. Um, and I don't get the exact numbers, but out of about 50 genomes, we had 27. So we had slightly over half. Um, and these were the endemic viruses and so forth. So we started uploading these. And very quickly, we started to see that the Washington cluster was actually something unique. And I'll show that on the next slide. We worked at uh, an analysis that's really been led by Trevor Bedford and other colleagues and, and big bunches of people involved. You're going to see tons of names and I won't be able to read them all. But if you look at the Washington clusters, you can see here in red, you know, the, the vast majority of them actually all cluster in this one area. These are the, you know, really these early cases that we saw. They were really from mostly a single introduction event. Now, whether it was right here in Washington or, or somewhere close by is still uh, under investigation. There was a later uh, uh, introduction that, that, that caused some infections and then some sporadic things. But these early on ones, you can see from these early dates, really all started uh, from this single clone. And what's really interesting um, is that then we were able to work with Charles Chu and folks down in California and demonstrate that actually uh, these Washington cases actually um, at least partially seeded the California outbreak. So uh, Charles uh, put this now on a circular plot, but you can see uh, here are some of the um, California cases uh, from Northern California. And these actually cluster very closely with the Washington cases. Now California had a lot of introductions from other places as well, so it wasn't all here, um, 
but it was a substantial number of the early cases out of California. We worked with uh, Nathan Grubach uh, at Yale and colleagues and looked at what was happening to the East Coast. And again, you saw a similar thing is that um, this Yale cluster, some of the early cases actually did uh, fall together with, with the Washington cases as well, but not all of them. And in fact, what Nathan went on to do was to show that um, it was really travel patterns that, that, that the East Coast was it's actually being sort of flooded by introductions from all over the world. And we had these Washington cases that they were very aware of because of all the sequences that we've been doing. But in fact, they had a number of introductions from other places. And it turned out that these other ones actually are what ultimately seeded the big outbreaks on the East Coast that we've seen. So once you have the sequence, of course, you can make a PCR test. And um, early on in this, you might remember these sorts of stories. Um, this is a nice one that was in the New Yorker that featured some of the work that we did. Um, there was really a breakdown in testing in the US. So once the sequence became available, um, people could make assays. And um, Alex and I discussed, Alex Greninger, who Larry mentioned, and I discussed this really early in January. And really, as soon as the sequence became available out of China, uh, we started working on a test. So we started designing primers and we started looking for primers and probes that other folks had made. Um, you might remember that the WHO made a, a kind of a, uh, made a test or adopted a test. Um, the CDC decided to make their own test. Um, and of course, designing the primers and probes generally is something that many groups know how to do. Unfortunately, um, early on, all the testing was sort of uh, kept very, very closely. And originally, everything had to be tested at CDC in Atlanta. Um, subsequently, um, CDC actually started manufacturing these kits you see here and then sent them out to public health labs. As, as Atlanta kind of got overwhelmed with all this testing, they said, well, well, we'll let this go out to individual states, but you have to run our test. And of course, many of you will know the story that these test kits were actually flawed and really um, the vast majority of states were unable to generate valid data using that test at first. Um, and so for really some critical weeks early on, unfortunately in all this, the country was largely flying blind just because we didn't have valid tests that, we, uh, that were available. And in the meantime, laboratories like ours who had been working to develop and validate a test um, weren't actually able to use it. So it, um, one of the interesting aspects about this, and, and it's important for our, our uh, past colleagues to know as we become one department, we're very, very interested in what we call laboratory developed tests. We design tests that, that are based on um, uh, test components that we assemble, designs that we make, and then we offer it to people within our medical system. Um, and um, generally, that's allowed, and FDA allows that, and the oversight is through CAP and, and the Centers for uh, CMS and so forth. Um, but once something's declared an emergency, actually, that, that what, what we call enforcement discretion that um, will let other people regulate you, that all goes out the window. And suddenly, because coronavirus was declared an emergency, um, the level of proof became really uh, very, very high and the bar or the regulatory hurdles that we would need to pass to be able to do testing really became difficult. Um, and so uh, a lot of February was spent um, in, in, in trying to meet demands that, that FDA was putting and, and, and Alex spent a lot of time on the phone with them and via email uh, trying to understand um, really how we might be allowed uh, to do testing. And so um, we were very, very close to actually meeting all the hoops that had been put there uh, in front of us when really the situation kind of exploded on the ground. Um, and ultimately FDA uh, decided to relax those rules and essentially make it much easier for academic labs to, uh, to, to move ahead. To basically say, as long as you have completed this validation you may begin testing and we'll give you a grace period to get all the documents actually sent in to, to our satisfaction. And so that was a green light. So at the beginning of March, we started testing. Um, and, and really at the beginning, UW Medicine, UW Virology is one of the few places that was actually testing. And it was really, you know, thank goodness to one of the good decisions that we made, which was to start getting ready in January. 
Um, and there were a handful of academic labs around the country that had done that. And so really when the CDC testing uh, really wasn't working, the state labs were becoming overwhelmed, we were able actually to step in and start to do some tests. So there's a whole lot that's gone into that. And of course, one of the things is that you need to, to validate these tests. You need to prove that they work and provide uh, reliable results uh, reproducibly for patients. You need to prove that the various sample types that come in are going to work. Um, and you need to really clarify the performance characteristics of the assay so that people know how much virus needs to be there for me to see it and will it cross react with other viruses and all these things. And so Arun Nala actually, who was in our lab and was about to actually leave and move on to a new job um, at the beginning of March, actually stayed on a couple of weeks, uh, actually negotiated with his new employer so he could stay and complete this work. And so this was actually a comparison of various um, primers and probe sets. The CDC primers and probes um, actually had a, a third flawed set that we didn't, uh, that kind of just didn't make the table here because it performed so poorly. The Corman primers are the WHA primers. BGI is a company from China, actually run by a UW alumnus. Um, and basically what we showed is that these primers and probes all worked reasonably well in our hands um, in sort of this laboratory developed test. So something that we built, that we've established in our lab, and, and, and then we were able to offer. And at the peak, at that early peak, we were able to do a little over 3,000 tests a day, sort of at, 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 during the initial panic when we were the only place to test, we did about 3,000 a day. Um, subsequently, manufacturers have come in with other tests as well. So we now run a mixture of our LDT plus commercial assays. Um, we run this Cobas 6800 from Roche assay a lot. We run this Panther Fusion assay a lot. Um, we run this diasorin, which is a rapid assay, um, less frequently, but in time urgent situations. And then uh, a lot of people are interested in this gene expert test as well. Um, so Josh Lieberman from our, from our department led this study and basically showed that really all of these have quite comparable, um, quite comparable performance. There's, there's subtle differences in their sensitivity, but to a first approximation and, 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 and to the level that we need for clinical use, they're pretty well equivalent. And this is different from some of the things you've seen some difficulties with the rapid assays uh, like the ID now and so forth that have struggled with sensitivity. Um, and really in some cases haven't been sensitive enough to really be useful clinically. So there's just a ton of work that goes into all of this. And, and I wanna call out the work that Garrett Pachetti's done in the lab. So Garrett's really uh, done Yeoman's work in terms of uh, just validating things like what kind of specimens can we use? Um, what about, can, can we accept things in PBS? Um, everybody ran out of viral transport media, right? You remember these early you know, shortages of everything. So could we just give people PBS and put them in? The answer is, yeah, it works just fine. Um, can you um, put the multiple primer and probe sets into one reaction? You know, um, typically the CDC N1 and N2 primer probe sets go in different wells. Of course, that cuts your throughput in half. Can you put them in the same well? And Garrett showed that you, know, you can do that uh, with still quite good performance. Um, and part of uh, the other thing that Garrett did really that was very, very cool uh, as part of this was to actually establish a digital PCR assay um, that we can actually use now to um, not only look at performance of assays, but also to get quantitative information and allow us to actually um, calibrate our other instruments so that we can actually get quantitative values from these other instruments. I've talked a lot about what's happening in our in our laboratory at, at, at the main UW site, but I want to call out some great work that's happened at the uh, UW Virology uh, Lab up at Harborview. Um, and this is led by Bob Coombs and Emily Dugley Angeli, who also did this work um, validating another commercial assay, the Abbott Real-Time SARS Coronavirus 2 assay. Um, this is also quite a high throughput assay. And, um, and now is something that we have that's being used to support a number of studies, uh, provides us great backup capacity if we start to have more demand than, than we can handle. Uh, we always have this in our reserve. And also a, a really important finding out of this came out is that of the commercial assays, this Abbott assay is probably among the most sensitive. It's a very, very sensitive assay. And if we have situations in which we have patients with very low viral loads, which we still wanna be able to follow them, this may be the assay that we wanna to go to.
Now, one of the questions that came up early on, and you might remember this, there were stories and they came out of a couple of papers in China that said, oh, these, these coronavirus PCR tests aren't very sensitive and there's a lot of false negatives. And, and that caused a lot of worry for a couple of weeks, probably in late March or early April. And so we started a study um, and ultimately found out that colleagues at Stanford, led by Ben Pinsky, who actually trained here at UW with us, and, and I think with you guys in path as well, um, were doing almost exactly the same studies. So we joined forces um, and, and actually uh, combined our experiences into one paper. And basically what we did was to take people who um, had shown up to our healthcare systems, got a negative result from us, but then we were able to find through the laboratory information system they had gotten a follow-up test within a week. So the idea being that if we're having false negatives in these tests, for whatever reason, it's unreliable, it, it only works sometimes, not others, um, we, sh we, we should detect those in these follow-up tests that happen within a week. And so, um, you know, the people in China were saying, you know, 30% false negatives. What did we see in these sorts of studies? And this was about 20,000 people between the two institutions actually met those criteria. And so here's just over time after this initial negative test, um, how many of them end up getting a positive test? And what you can see, either the UW experience or the Stanford experience here in gold, it's really quite rare that somebody has a follow-up positive test within a week. It's, it's less than, a, it's about 3% of people actually end up with this uh, positive later. And uh, we don't really know what that, what that really means beyond that. Um, it gives you, I think, an upper bound for false negatives. Um, some of these people really weren't infected back here and got infected during this week. Other people may have been infected, but just had such low viral loads that they actually didn't get enough virus in their nasal cavity to detect until later in the week. But it says the false negative rate is nowhere near this 30%. In fact, these tests are very, very reliable and, 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 and we can trust them. So we got this testing on board um, and you know it was combined with social distancing and physical distancing and ultimately things like mask wearing and contact tracing. And in fact, we did a pretty good job at flattening the curves. So this was an experience that we published a little while back now in JAMA, simply showing um, in panel B how many tests we were doing each day. So it varies and it's low on the weekends, as you can see, um, but it's you know um, probably going up only slightly. But here's our positivity rate. So if we look at outpatients around the state, you know, we peaked at maybe around 13, 14%, and then it started to fall. Uh, at the end of March, you can see the same thing for outpatients from Seattle, um, similar positivity rates. And then people who presented to the emergency department were up here maybe around 17%, and these all fell. Um, and that's continued. We actually, interestingly enough, uh, in the original version of this paper, had a statistical projection of where these would go, and they predicted that by today we'd be at about 1% to 2%. Uh, the editors made us take that out. Uh, but it turned out to be pretty true, as I'll show you later, that that's probably about where we are uh, these days. So. Um, you know, the, the effort having testing available and having a responsive, you know, public sector actually really helped us flatten the curve and get control of, of the pandemic locally. So we worked a lot with um, clinicians and, and, and people to try and understand how to use this. This was a very early experience um, that, that, that Pavan uh, led here in Seattle, just looking at what happens with these early COVID positive patients that we have. And of this early group, this was like the first 24 or so, you can see people really didn't do well. This was quite sobering. About half of this original cohort of people died. And there's a lot more clinical information in this paper, um, but it was very, very sobering and concerning. And of course it still is, um, but we've continued to do more studies like this in this more recent look at hospitalized patients by Fred Buckner and Nina Kim. Um, really is showing that, you know, we're getting better at handling patients and understanding patients or, or finding them sooner and intervening. And, um, you know, we're, having, we're discharging many more people now than are actually dying in the hospital. And, and those are all good pieces of news. Um, so, I, you know, I, I think, again, there's so many things that we're learning about this as, as we're going. Um, things about just you know, positioning uh, patients with COVID so they can breathe better often on their stomachs is better. You know, we're starting to have antivirals available. 
Uh, you've heard about the dexamethasone story from from uh, just yesterday, the last couple of days. So we're we're managing these infections better, but there are still deaths every day from COVID nineteen. One thing we've tried to do to protect the population within a hospital system is we started to screen everyone who comes into the hospital system, and this really got started in the. Uh, OB service. This was a study that uh, that was led by uh, Sylvia LaCourse that we uh, were part of, um, and essentially they took everybody who was coming in um, for uh, uh, pregnancy visits, postpartum visits. Um, some of some of the people on their service actually called in because they were were symptomatic. Other people were just screened because they were going to screen everybody. Some of them turned out to be symptomatic, and a fair number of those were positive, about 22 percent. Of the asymptomatic folks, uh, only one turned out to be positive, but that was the person. And here's how they did. Um, they were all, all discharged and, and basically went through a course where they had virus, and then it slowly went away over time. And you can see they become not detected at the end. Um, uh, this has been subsequently uh, brought across the entire hospital. Um, so all patients who are admitted or, or who are going into aerosol generating procedures get tested. And we're finding about one half of 1% of those test positive. And, and the report of this was led by Alex Mays and Patrick Mathias. Um, you know, and I guess there's two ways to look at this. One, you'd say, oh, well, they're hardly ever positive. Uh, the flip side is you can imagine what would have happened if these 20 or 25 patients between these two studies had actually gotten into the hospital and, and gone through the, the, all the procedures that, that, that they've been involved with without COVID protections. Um, we could have had a tremendous number of uh, nosocomial infections. So we've really been able to avoid that because of this kind of work. We've looked at um, our own employees. Um, this was uh, the experience from employee testing. So um, very early on, we established, uh, we being UW Medicine, established a uh, drive-through clinic for employees. So if you thought you had symptoms, you would fill out a questionnaire and if they were deemed to be suggestive of COVID, or suspicious for COVID, um, you could get an appointment and drive in and get your tested. And um, what we saw from that is, um, yeah, our people did get COVID and the people who uh, thought they were symptomatic and were concerned about it, about five to 6% actually um, were positive for the virus. Oops. And um, it's interesting that this really didn't differ between people on the front lines um, so these would be people in the emergency departments, the, the COVID units uh, within the hospital, uh, excuse me, the frontline people versus the non-frontline people, that this rate was very, very similar, probably suggesting that most of these infections actually weren't acquired in the hospital, but were acquired in the community. There clearly are cases where hospital workers have gotten the infection in the course of their, of their, uh, of their, of their work or, or thought to have, have gotten it there. Um, and of course, those are tragic cases as well. And this is something I'm really uh, proud of is that um, you know, we've talked a lot about capacity and how many tests we can do. One thing we worked hard to do is to get the tests reported quickly. You, you might recall that um, once testing became more widely available, there were these stories about these huge backlogs to take a week or 10 days to get your results. We were always trying to get our tests turned around and measured in hours rather than days. And generally we've done a good job about that. And so what that allowed was that um, it meant that when uh, there were possibilities for organ transplantation, we could actually get uh, prospective donors uh, tested uh, for that so that there wouldn't be a concern about um, um, passing the, the infection along with organs. And, and so here is just the proportion of wait list inactivation. So did you have to basically shut down your transplant uh, service uh, based on COVID. So here's week one, two, three, four. Uh, this is uh, kind of right in the, this early part of the, of the outbreak. So uh, probably March, April period. And what you can see is that if we look at the Northwest, the Northwest shut things down early on, and then we got this rapid testing going. And really there's been very, very little difference. Um, you know, the, the services are operating at really close to normal capacity which is really fantastic. And that hasn't been true throughout the country. So we're really happy to be able to do this. And, and that was great work that was, uh, again, Josh Lieberman did a lot of work to make this possible, working together with Ajit LeMay and others. Um, another thing that we 
he collaborated on that was really exciting was some work that was led by uh, Santiago Neme and, and Alison Roxby, um, intensively looking at group living facilities. And as proof of principle, we looked at one, uh, one uh, assisted living facility that really hadn't had great uh, large outbreaks, but where there was substantial concern. You remember how catastrophic this illness can be in older populations and, and what a large proportion of people within a given facility can get infected very rapidly. Um, so we went into this uh, facility and actually tested everybody, all the staff and all the, all the residents, and actually found a number of folks who were positive, um, five, or five residents and, and, and or, excuse me, four residents and two staff members. Um, really who are minimally symptomatic. Some really reported no symptoms, others were pretty mild, some cough that it resolves, some body aches and so forth, a headache. Um, and got these people sequestered away from everybody else basically, um, really got very strict on the physical distancing. And it's been really a success story that, you know, that was the end of the outbreak in this particular facility um, and really led to a model which is now finally becoming more globally uh, used is that really these sorts of extended and assisted living facilities and nursing homes really need to have a very robust testing, really get in there, try to test everybody and try to prevent these outbreaks from happening. Um, so here's where we are today and this relates to what I just told you. Um, if, if you're curious about how things are going, you can always go to our Twitter page uh, on UW Virology um, and, and every day we'll, we'll post how many tests we did that day and what percentage was positive. And so yesterday was actually our biggest testing day ever. We did 5,514 tests, um, of which 3.2% were positive. So here's the big tall bar. The gray ones are positives down here. You can see that 3% is actually a little bit higher than we've seen the last few days. We've usually been right around one or 2%. So we need to watch this. Um, if this is, see if this is an indicator that Western Washington is starting to lose control of the virus. We also just have noise in these numbers from day to day, so we'll need to watch this. Um, so what happened here? You know, why did this go up so dramatically? And there are really two things. Um, the first one relates to what I just said is that um, because of this experience of how important getting these group living facilities tested really is, um, the state made a mandate that, that all these facilities within the state had to test um, by uh, the middle of June. And so you can see that a lot of tests came in um, right here close to the deadline and people trying to make sure they stayed compliant. So we had a, a pretty crazy weekend last weekend trying to get all those tested. I have to call out all the people who worked nights and, and just volunteered and came in and really got all that done. It was a very, very impressive piece of work clinically. And this sort of was superimposed upon the fact that right about here, the city of Seattle opened a couple of drop-in testing sites. Um, they're actually in the old um, emissions testing sites. There's one on Aurora. There's one in Soto where you used to go in and get your car tested. Um, now these are COVID testing sites. So you can go in there and do that. All right, I wanna switch gears a little bit and talk about serology. Um, so all the PCR tests that I've been telling you about or even the sequencing stuff really is looking at the virus that's in you right now, right? So it tells you, is there an infection now? Antibody testing is different. This is giving you a historic record of have you been infected sometime in the past? And so what do we do with this information? Um, it's certainly useful in terms of doing population-based studies of seroprevalence. So we might wanna know in Western Washington, what proportion of our population has actually been infected so far? And this is important as we think about making public policy and, and, and as we make recommendations to, to policymakers, we need this kind of information. Very occasionally, serology can be useful in primary diagnosis. There have been anecdotal reports of people who might have lower respiratory virus disease with rel relatively little virus in the nasopharynx, so, so they may be PCR negative. And some of those people have been found initially by serology. That's rare and we don't recommend it to be used for that in general. Lots of people wanna know if they can use this for their risk status. Um, you know, hey, if I have these antibodies, can I forget any of this ever happened? We don't really have the data for that right now. From what we know about coronavirus immunity, um, having these antibodies should provide you some protection. 
We don't know whether it'll be complete um, and we don't know how long it'll last. And we don't really know that it'll be meaningful. So these are questions that need to be answered. They're going to be answered. You'll see over the next couple of months, uh, we'll start to get these answers and, and there may end up being more demand for testing once we know more about what it means. Similarly, employers and, and other people are interested in using this for back to work decisions. Um, again, it may provide a baseline, um, but it's probably unlikely to, to, to really be the deciding factor of, of how places can open back and go back to work. When we were looking for a serologic assay, we wanted a couple of things. We wanted it to be sensitive. That means that if the antibodies are there, will you find them? We really, really cared that the test was specific. That is, um, we, we want to know that when we give a positive result, we have a high degree of confidence that that result is correct. Um, we don't want false positives in this kind of testing because it can lead people to do the wrong thing and it can lead wrong policy decisions if you think that a huge proportion of your population has these antibodies when they don't. Um, we want a test that correlates with meaningful immunity. That jury's still out a bit. And then we want high throughput. We assume, like anything else, there's going to be big demand for this. So ideally, it goes on some instrument that we already have. Here is uh, Greg Pepper in our lab, our, uh, our, our laboratory manager, uh, putting something on, on one of our immunoanalyzers. And so we actually settled on the Abbott SARS-CoV-2 IgG assay. This is a chemiluminescent microparticle immunoassay. Uh, so it's qualitative detection of antibodies to SARS. Um, it actually detects antibodies to the nucleocapsid protein. So remember, this is what, what surrounds the viral genome. It's a great target to use for a test like this because it, the virus has to make a ton of this stuff because that's a big genome. And so it's very, very immunogenic. So it's one of the first things people make antibodies to. And it's very, very sensitive. So it's wonderful for that. Um, the flip side of that is that we don't know, or, or it's unlikely that an antibody to nucleocapsid is actually going to be neutralizing in and of itself. Uh, because it's something that's on the inside of the virus. Um, our, our, the most likely situation is that this correlates with the sorts of antibodies that are the ones that actually cause the protection and just gives you a surrogate and a more easily detected surrogate for those. I'll show you a little bit of data for that. Uh, that remains to be formally proven. We do this on these, this architect system. It's a very, very common system. There are, are hundreds or maybe thousands of those throughout the country. Each one can do about 3,000 samples a day. Uh, we have several in our lab. So you can see there is the capacity to do a tremendous amount of serologic testing. Um, so what does this look like? The, the test actually gives you an index value and there's a cutoff. So this red line is the cutoff. So anything below that is negative, anything above that is positive. So if we look at people um, who were hospitalized, we have multiple bloods we can test um, and then ask, uh, what was their index value? This is work, by the way, that Andrew Bar Bryan led. Thank you, Andrew. It's a great study. Um, so um, if you look at kind of, you know, day zero, these first couple of days to get in the hospital, most people are negative. And then as time goes on, you see more and more people start to have these antibodies until at some point everybody does. You can also make that graph uh, days since the first PCR positivity. This is almost always a couple of days after they have symptoms. So everything's delayed a little bit. You see the same thing. And so here is just the, the, the sensitivity, uh, what proportion do you see? And, and what you can see is that by certainly 17 days after uh, symptom onset, everybody's positive by this essay. We were very, very interested in specificity, as I said. Um, fortunately, we had a very big serum bank that we could test. So um, these were serum that had been sent to us for uh, herpes simplex virus testing. We have the kind of the gold standard assay for that. So lots of people send those from around the country. So uh, things that were sent um, before there was uh, COVID-19, we had about 1,020 samples easily accessible. And we just tested all those. And you can see of 1,020, only a single specimen actually uh, was uh, formally positive by the cutoff of 1.40. It was 1 100th of a, of a uh, index value above that. Um, so we did have one false positive. So giving us a specificity in, in, by these criteria of 99.9%. So those of you with the lab med background will love the receiver operating characteristic curves. Um, and I kind of had never seen anything like this. If we make our own cutoff based on our data uh, using anything between 1.42 and 1.49, we actually generate this rock curve, which is perfect. It's actually a triangle. 
uh, with 100% sensitivity and 100% specificity. And that's pretty unprecedented for most laboratory testing, uh, a really, really uh, very high performing test. Um, it's not the only high performing test out there by any means. I don't mean to imply that, but um, it does work extremely well. Um, we were interested in how reproducible these things are. So one thing that we did was to uh, find patients who had uh, multiple specimens on the same day. And then we tested all those and said, well, what's the coefficient of variation between those? And it's actually reasonably tight. Um, so this is plotted again, the CV versus the index value. And so like many laboratory tests, things with low measurements uh, tend to have higher CVs. Um, things with higher measurements tend to cluster more tightly. But interestingly is that um, what we saw is that part of the reason why we had some really high coefficients of variation is we found patients who were actually in the process of serial converting, uh, which we show here for some individual patients. So here's days uh, since symptom onset. Here's their index value. You can see on this day, this person suddenly rapidly begins to serial convert. And so you can imagine getting three samples on this curve you actually get a very uh, large coefficient of variation, and it's really biological. It's not about anything wrong, being wrong with the assay. So you can actually watch people seroconvert with this assay. It's actually very useful as we try to understand um, patients' outcomes uh, and interpretation of serologic tests. I mentioned that uh, we wanna know the correlation between this nucleopro nucleoprotein response and this anti-spike response. Um, so Mark Wenner in uh, the immunology division had established the Euromune uh, assay. This targets the spike uh, protein, the S protein. And so if we just look at um, our index value versus the Euromune index value, you see a, a, a nice correlation. This suggests that when people develop an immune response to COVID, they develop a broad, uh, a broad response so that it really doesn't matter which of the targets you look for. And we continue to evaluate this in, in much larger sample sets now. We've done a lot of work looking at how many, how many people are infected. So uh, we did a, a, a study in Boise, Idaho in late April with this group called Crush the Curve. Um, they found overall about 1.8% of people who volunteered to be in this study in Idaho uh, had been proven to be seropositive. We've done now almost 35,000 tests in clinical testing at UW Virology of about 5% have been positive. Um, so you know, these, all these people are going to be selected, right? They're self-selected. These are people who have had some reason to want to get tested. They think they've had COVID in the past. They think they've been exposed. So this probably overestimates the true prevalence. Um, but I think one lesson from this data is we are not at the level where we can start thinking about herd immunity. We would need 60, 70, 80% of the population of antibodies for that to happen. And we're nowhere near that right now. Here's some other uh, things. So this is actually out of date now. Um, we've looked at UW Medicine patients. They're a little bit higher. The Hutch did a return to work study. These were, this is a young, healthy population, um, just randomly selected from employees at the Hutch. This is probably closer to reality then. It's 1.25%. And we're doing this for all the UW Medicine employees now. And, and I think you should, should all have the opportunity to get this test if you want it for that. So, you know, these aren't necessarily reflective of what's going on in Washington state. So we actually are uh, just starting a, a, a statewide seroprevalence study with support from the Paul Allen Family Foundation. We'll be recruiting 7,000 participants from all over the state. This will be a random address based household sample. Um, we'll have field teams that will go out and work with counties to get this. We'll be looking at um, racial and ethnic subgroups um, to make sure that we have valid statistics on them. And, 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 and there should actually be a formal announcement of this, uh, I'm hoping, by the end of this week. Um, and, and, and this will actually ramp up and we'll really get a good look at what's going on, um, not only in Western Washington, but across the state. I want to show a little bit of data from a paper that, uh, that another paper that Andrew put together, um, just looking at what's the relationship of these serologic results, these antibody responses, uh, or excuse me, the, the viral loads with these antibody responses. So not surprisingly, um, people who don't have antibody yet, so that we're down here, are often people early in disease and, and sick. And, and we know that typically the highest viral loads we see in any patient is their first test. That by the time they show up to us, they've reached their peak of virus and they're actually 
on the downhill slope of, of, of their infection. Um, and so if you look at this, you know, these are the people with, with high viral loads. Once people develop antibodies, their viral loads actually decrease, and that's illustrated by these higher CT values out here. And you can do that either by symptom onset or PCR and get the same results. Um, this shows a similar thing for individual patients. You can see in blue as the antibody comes up, the, the cycle thresholds are increasing, meaning their viral loads are going away. And that's very, very consistent across patients. But I want to leave with you know, one final bit of data that fell out of this paper, which I think that these sorts of tests, and particularly the ability to look at viral load and say, is there a lot, is there little, is actually important prognostically for these patients. And we're actually prevented by the FDA um, from reporting viral loads clinically to providers. All we can give is, a, is the virus there, yes or no. But if you look at people who come in with very, very high viral loads, again, these, these, these low threshold cycles, these are people with high viral loads, they are much more likely to not survive their hospitalizations than people who come in with high viral loads. So these are, you know, did people die? These are these Xs. So, you know, if you show up with a, with a higher CT value and less virus, you're much more likely to do well and survive your hospitalization. So I think there's actually prognostic value in these, in these numbers. You can actually do a similar thing with the antibodies. If you come in not having antibodies and you're already sick, you know, the virus has gotten ahead of you and you don't do as well than if you show up uh, already starting to make antibodies. So I think that there's a prognostic value in this and we're really trying to generate convincing data that will show this so that, you know, practice around the country can actually change. So what's going to happen now? I uh, actually, you know, made this a little while back. So I, I predicted that, you know, demand for testing would increase. And that has certainly happened. Uh, as you saw, our demand for testing has increased dramatically. Um, I, I think the demand for serology is going to increase once we have data that says, yeah, these antibodies protect you at least from severe disease. Um, you know, right now we're, we're, we're not doing all that many tests, uh, not nearly as many as we could, but I still think that that's going to increase. Um, in terms of what's happening therapeutically in this, you know, the pipeline's unclear. Um, people get diagnosed late. There's this big immunopathological component that happens, uh, you know, late in the course of illness. Um, and so, you know, we've seen some good results from remdesivir and antiviral, probably best used earlier in the course. And then this data that's just come out about the dexamethasone um, for people in the later courses of illness where, you know, their bodies mostly controlled the virus, but this, this immunopathology is so tremendous and that's what people are actually dying of. So uh, the, the, the dexamethasone really had a pretty substantial uh, improvement in survival. We'll look forward to formally seeing that data in, in the publication. Uh, so we can evaluate that uh, more carefully. And then finally, we're all working on vaccines. We're part of this. And, you know, the vaccine effort is, is really an impressive effort um, with, with all kinds of groups from all over the country and world working together. And it's actually progressing well. Um, it is still on track. Um, something could happen at any moment. Uh, the sci you know, it's science and biology, so it's not predictable. But the early vaccine candidates are immunogenic. They seem to be safe in the small trials. And so it's the phase three trials are starting up and we'll see whether they actually protect people. Um, and if so, uh, there may be substantial manufacturing capacity um, by late fall and early winter. So just to wrap up, you know, I think that the ability to, to sequence virus is incredibly important. It really needs to be spread into more places so that um, regardless of where the virus shows up first, because this is not going to be the last pandemic, it can be found as soon as possible because that's, that allows us to, to respond. Um, if the virus had hit the US, it, it picked an advantageous place for us as a country for it to come because we were as ready as anybody. So the fact that it came here to Western Washington was actually a bit of good luck. Um, now there's lots of commercial assays, they perform well and, and they're easier to use for sure. But having all these platforms really allowed us to respond and flatten the curve. Um, Testing is really useful in supporting our hospitalized patients and, 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 and others around the community. Um, the serologic assays can work well. Uh, I didn't stress it too much, but there are, are and were especially some really terrible assays out there that didn't perform well. Um, generally now we, we know which assays work well and there's several manufacturers um, and those are the ones people need to get used. Surveillance right now is low. We're nowhere near herd immunity. 
and finally, you know, I'd like to see some more use of quantitative PCR and quantitative testing to help manage our patients. And with that, I'll go to my acknowledgement slide. I, you know, there's so many people involved in this, I hesitate to call out any names. Uh, so folks at UW Virology, but I'll break down a little bit. Um, you know, I mentioned Alex Gunninger a couple of times. He's been critically important in all of this and, and, and worked tirelessly. Greg Pepper, who's led the clinical program, has worked unbelievably tirelessly uh, to make all this happen, is really one of the unsung heroes in this. Um, the entire department has stepped up. You know, Jeff Baird has been incredibly useful in getting the resources that we needed to, to build this, this just mammoth effort to, to allow this testing. Um, and, and, and everybody who's volunteered, we've had volunteers from other parts of the department have come in and on a moment's notice when we've been crushed with specimens like this weekend. Thank you to all them. UW Medicine's been incredibly supportive all the way up to Dean Ramsey. Again, you know, whatever we need to, to make this testing happen. Hutch has been great collaborators. And then there's way too many collaborators to, to, to name. I, if the names were all up there, really small, you know, uh, take a look at those. Um, but I'm grateful to everybody who's, who's allowed, you know, the, the team to really make this happen. So with that, I'll stop. Thank you for your attention and happy to take some questions. Super, Keith. Um, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. So uh, in the interim, we have um, many questions. Uh, let me try to group them together. Um, one of them has to do with host susceptibility, uh, different frequencies in men versus women. There are um, host effects for time of the day, for example, or diet, which might affect the viral load, as some of those pre-analytical variables. Yeah, so we've actually done a study with Dan Garrity and Louis Ping um, here at the Hutch, um, looking at uh, host immunogenetics, and 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 we found several um, HLA loci that are actually quite predictive of hospitalization. Um, so that's under review right now, um, with odds ratios, um, you know, a couple of. of the, the, the risk alleles about fourfold increase and the protective alleles at about uh, fourfold decrease in risk um, and high is statistically significant, mostly in the uh, BRB locus that we've seen, interestingly <clears throat> enough. Okay. So, um, you know, and then we, I'm sure there's other things. We've looked at some cures. There are some cure associations that, that, that may fall out. We just need to verify. So there's certainly that. Um, but, you know, it's all overlaid over comorbidities and age. So for that study, we actually excluded everybody over, oh gosh, was it 45, I think. So we wanted to look at people who, you know, were less likely to have these other things that would wash out the signals. Um, but I think there is definitely a host component here. Does gender make a difference? Well, in general, men seem to be doing worse with this, um, you know, and it's it, that could just be associated with comorbidity um comorbidities it's a little hard to say right now you know differences in smoking and other risk factors um, general poor health um so we'll see whether there's a you know, I don't know a biological reason for that or, or not okay uh some questions about um uh, where the virus appears and also, even which organs it affects, but one question about, have you assayed for the virus in blood, urine, feces? Yeah, so, um, so th yeah, there's a, there's a whole lot there. So, I mean, the virus really wants to live in the lung, and the, the highest viral loads are in the lung. So when we sample the nasopharynx, one thing to remember is that's really not the virus's home. It's close mm -hmm. to the home. And, and so, you know, there have been cases where we miss it, that there's virus in the lung, and, and that particular person just doesn't have much in the nasopharynx for whatever reason, and it's hard to detect. Um, but we know the virus is also in a lot of other places. You, you asked about feces. There's definitely viral RNA and that's detected in feces. It's unclear. It's probably not infectious. Um, there still remains a little bit controversial. Clearly not a major source of, of viral uh, spread. Um, but the other important thing to realize is that there is also viremia and there is a huge thrombotic and sort of cardiovascular component oh. to this infection. And, um, you know, it's been relatively understudied. We were actually on a call just earlier today, you know, hopefully looking at this in a really big cohort of people, um, you know, so just looking in blood and then, you know, also in other organs, but you can definitely see that, 
you know, you're hearing about, you know, COVID toe that's in otherwise healthy young people, right? That there's these thrombotic events that are causing, it looks like frostbite almost. And then there's clearly an elevated risk of stroke and heart attack in, in people who are suffering uh, from, from COVID. Oh, uh, question, is there evidence for, uh, good evidence for reactivation or super infection? Yeah, that's a great question. I think there's probably recrudescence. Um, in, you know, I'd really like to get some people who are studied very intensively over time and actually, you know, not only look at the viral loads, but then sequence and, and make sure it's the same virus, you know, and, and, you know, is this a new virus, super infection or not? That's a critical question. You know, super infection is always concerning in every virus because it means that natural immunity is incomplete, right? So we're very, very, very interested in seeing that. Um, and I think the jury's still out. I suspect we're going to see some cases of that. And, you know, we'll, we'll, we've already heard some anecdotes and I think there'll probably be more. What we'll be really interested in is just statistically, you know, robust estimates about, you know, how much do you decrease your likelihood of getting reinfected um, either by previous infection or vaccination? And then if you do get infected, how sick are you? Mm -hmm. um, let's see, there were, also relevant to, well, you mentioned dexamethasone and issues in some patients of cytokine storm. Storm Is there, are you or colleagues measuring uh, some of the lymphokines, IL-6, some of the other products that can influence the cytokine storms? So we're not, we're not measuring that in our lab. So, um, so that's, uh, but I think that, you know, clearly the cytokine storm is an important thing. And I think actually, you know, our emerging understanding is that once people get past, you know, I don't know, it's hard to put an exact number, but this first week or so, week or 10 days of their severe illness, really their problem is not the virus, their problem becomes the body's response to it. So I suspect what you're going to see is a movement toward uh, kind of a, a, a sequential therapy where early on, we're going to want to get people on things like remdesivir and really try to get that viral load down as quickly as possible. And then once we know that the virus is down and we can measure that by quantitative PCR, then we want to monitor them for this, you know, over exuberant immune response and cytokine storm and then come in with things like the IL-6 antagonists if we want to do something, you know, very targeted or, you know, if we need broad-based, inexpensive, widely available, we come in with something like dexamethasone and really tamp that down. And, you know, both of those have shown survival advantages. So, you know, I'm sure that there are trials, you know, people starting to think about using them sequentially. A uh, question about um, most of the vaccines are gonna target the spike protein. Are you developing clinical assays to measure the anti-spike protein antibodies? Yeah, so, um, so our test hits the nuclear protein, the, the nuclear capsid yeah. protein. So, what you want to do for, for following a vaccine trial is you want to have antibodies, you want to measure antibodies to both, right? Because the, yeah, the vaccines are almost all some variant on spike. Um, so we want to be able to tell the patients who have anti-spike versus uh, who, who got their immune response from vaccination versus those who got it from some infection in the past. So, um, so you know, so we do have access to those assays. I think probably for the vaccine trials, it won't be our lab who does the anti-spike, um, just because there's other folks who've you know got that ramped up to big volume and it's a big team effort. So uh, we'll be contributing a, a lot of the, um, the viral load assays as well as the anti-nuclear protein assays. Okay. Here's a very practical question. How does one participate in the Washington seroprevalence study? Well, that's a great question, and uh, you got to a little bit stay tuned for, for that. Basically, um, so the 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 plan will be we will um, we will actually work with individual county level authorities to develop the best outreach, an appropriate outreach approach for that county. Um, in in initial conversations with them, the way you approach people can be different in different parts of the state when you say, hey, I'm here for this, you know, I'm here from the University of Washington and I want to take your blood and, you know, we're going to give this information to the government. You know, you may want to do that in different ways in different places. So, um, but 
probably this is not going to be a study that you volunteer for. You'll actually be selected randomly and then asked to participate. Um, and that'll give us robust statistics and a, a valid approach. So, um, you know, and, and CDC has developed uh, approaches for this that, that, that we're going to follow. Um, there are a number of other seroprevalence studies. So, you know, anybody on this call, uh, per please participate in the UW study. You should have gotten an email, I think. Um, we're on group two. We're kind of going from most at-risk people to least at-risk people. So um, our group, like the lab, are actually group two. So we, we were perceived, I actually argued that we weren't at that high of risk because we take precautions, but, you know, so we, we tested all the ICU workers and, and that sort of thing first. Um, but, you know, any, any part of UW Medicine, once we get to group three, you're going to have a chance to be tested. So please participate in that. Is, do you know if pathology is uh, group two or yeah. group three? Uh, no, I, I actually don't, I should know that. But pathology Maybe the is autopsy. Probably group, probably, yeah, it, you're probably going to be group three, I think. But okay. I might be wrong on that. So um, if you haven't been contacted yet, you're probably group three. Okay. Uh, Keith, uh, I, I could go on with questions. We're now um, five minutes over time. So uh, I suggest, uh, I don't know, there are a lot of good questions out there and maybe they can, what would you like to do? Just handle them by email? Um, happy to, you know, happy to, for, to always talk with people, you bet. That's that. Yep. Okay, yeah. so since we are over, with regret, uh, let us finish our grand rounds. I know there are other events scheduled. I think Lab Medicine has their um, um, research presentations now. So thank you very much for, I think it, you're, you're really, you have given the last uh, pathology grand rounds of this academic year. It's a wonderful way to, to end the year. Right. So thanks Great. very much. My pleasure. Okay. Thank you all for attending.